The Snapdragon X Elite is here and is this the beginning of the ARM PC revolution? Hey guys, what's going on? Diptesh here. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we will talk all about the Snapdragon X Elite SoC that is coming up and discuss why it is so important for the ARM PC revolution that I'm talking about. And also from a technical perspective, like you've seen all the benchmarks already, but from a technical perspective, how impressive the actual SoC is compared to its main rival, which is the Apple M2 Pro. And also I'll talk about some of the pros and cons of this type of SoC. So watch this video till the end. It's going to be very interesting and informative. But before all that, if you are new to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. Also consider joining our telegram community link in the description, engage in tech discussion with like-minded people and also get alerted on the best tech deals the earliest. With that said, guys, let's get right into it. So before we begin a quick recap on ARM versus x86, these two are the two most common CPU architectures and they basically differ based on the instruction sets they support. So basically ARM supports a reduced instruction set computing, whereas the uh, x86 is basically complex instruction set computing. Basically in short, what I mean to say is that x86 suited more for general purpose computing compared to ARM, which has reduced instruction set. Uh, which is why it needs to be tailor made for certain types of things for other things it may not be so good whereas x86 is synonymous with general purpose computing now there are pros and cons to both the main con of x86 is that since it supports so much legacy baggage there is so much legacy code it supports which is why it is not that great in terms of efficiency it is good x86 has improved by leaps and bounds especially these amd cpus are very very efficient but still, when it comes to ARM CPUs, they are just far more efficient when it comes to, you know, core efficiency as well as uncore efficiency. It's just the nature of ARM. So the main advantage of ARM that we're talking about is efficiency because general purpose computing is in its own place. But for the general public like you and me, if ARM is good enough for the purposes that you or me do, and if it is able to do them just as good while being far more efficient, that's where arm really shines so this is where the main key is that is efficiency arms efficiency is its biggest asset now why is this efficiency so important efficiency of a cpu is very important because efficiency will dictate the type of devices that are available so for example now x86 has also become very efficient for example the uh, AMD's Z1 Extreme, which is basically your Zen 4 7840U, 7840HS, they can be now put in tiny handles. Why? Because they are very efficient. The more efficient your CPUs, your core components are, you can fit them in smaller and smaller packages, which basically means you're improving portable power. So essentially you are able to now get higher performance in a smaller package. Let's say your phones, your tablets, your very thin and light laptops, those will get a huge boost in terms of performance. On top of this, it's obviously the battery life. So an efficient chip is able to provide a good amount of performance at a very low power package which is how you are able to fit it in a smaller chassis. On top of that, because it uses less power, you will also get better battery life. So in my opinion, ARM's main advantage will be in this very thin and light portable laptops and portable consoles or gaming consoles, handle console. This is where ARM will truly shine. However, the problem with ARM has always been its adoption. Are people willing to sacrifice the advantages of x86 and switch over to ARM? Like are developers ready to port their apps over to ARM and this is where the Snapdragon X Elite is really important for this ARM PC revolution. You may wonder why am I not talking about the Apple M series? Those are based on ARM architecture and they have done really good. But the thing is guys, those chips are really tailor made by Apple for their own operating system. That is for Mac OS. And you know how many people use Mac OS? This is a very small portion of the user base, like those people who use computers use Mac OS. The majority is using Windows. And Windows guys, let me tell you, has this problem where it has to support a huge amount of legacy code. Like the user base of Windows and its use cases is far more versatile or I would say far more varied and far more expansive compared to Mac OS users. So this is where the problem comes. Like are developers willing to adopt ARM and the, the limitations that come with ARM. Because like I said, you and me may not want, may not realize, but Windows is actually used for a lot of different types of purposes, which require special in instruction set, which x86 supports. So there is a job where Snapdragon X Elite has to, you know, 
convince uh, people like you and me and the developers that the performance per watt is so good that it is worth rewriting your application for ARM. And the work that Microsoft and Snapdragon has done collaborating between themselves and whatever upgrades that, uh, that the Snapdragon X Elite has brought to the table and the performance it has brought to the table is really exciting. And Windows is such a key factor in this, in this ARM PC revolution because most of the people use Windows. We really need a strong ARM chip that is very good with the Windows operating system. This is where the Snapdragon X Elite is so important because it is tied with Windows. Most of the focus with Snapdragon X Elite is Windows performance. So this is where I am, you know, t talking about the Snapdragon X Elite in the light that it is really important for the ARM PC revolution. The uh, Apple M series has really done has done really good, but you know, it only mostly affects Mac OS users. The whole chip is designed to uh, be the best at its performance and everything else when it comes to Mac OS. But here now Windows has a chip that is just as good as the Apple M series, but now it's for Windows, which affects a lot more user compared to uh, Mac and the Apple M series. Now I want to talk about why the Snapdragon X L8 is actually so impressive from a technical standpoint, from a chip manufacturing standpoint. Now you've already seen the benchmarks. I'm not going to waste too much time on these benchmarks, but here are the benchmarks on screen. Basically in short, the Snapdragon X L8 at 23 watts is mighty impressive. It is faster than the Apple M2 Pro. It's faster than the AMD Zen 4 uh, 7840HS, 7940HS APU. It is faster than Intel's 13 gen top end Intel 13 gen chip and also it's able to stretch its legs even further at 80 watt power limit which is something I never expected because there is something called the power curve which you know you get diminishing returns as you increase the power but there is a tangible difference between 23 watts and 80 watts like I'm pretty sure 80 watts is going to be impractical I'm sure the temperatures will be out of this world at 80 watts because these chips are really small in size so uh, I don't think so 80 watt will be practical but at 23 watts the performance is impressive and not just the CPU performance, but the GPU performance of the Snapdragon X Elite is also quite incredible. It is better than the best x86 iGPU that is available on the AMD Zen 4 7840 hs 740 which is the Radeon RX 780M. If you are a PC user, you would know about that. It is much faster than the 780M. Now I know that the 780M is one of the best x86 iGPUs, but it is still a very small iGPU. The iGPU comes in processors which are mainly CPUs first and GPUs second. So it's a much smaller iGPU compared to the compared to the iGPU that is present in the Snapdragon X Elite. So I'm not going to bash AMD for that. You know, the PC market is not really fond about iGPUs all that because in the PC market you have access to dedicated graphics cards. But nonetheless, the Snapdragon X Elite has a pretty beefy iGPU which is just about on par or actually a little bit faster than the Apple M2 iGPU, which is quite incredible. So these benchmarks are mighty impressive, but these will be even more impressive to you once you understand the chip design, what Snapdragon is able to fit in this tiny CPU or SOC. To understand this, you need to know about manufacturing nodes. So chip designers like AMD, Nvidia, uh, Qualcomm, these are fabulous chip designers. So. They don't have their own fabrication process. They don't have their own manufacturing process uh, to manufacture these chips. When they have to manufacture a chip, they have to go to chip manufacturers or like, you know, those who have fabrication process that is from, you know, TSMC or you've got Samsung, you've got Global Foundries, you got Intel who have their own fabs. So these are the people who actually manufacture these chips. And when it comes to manufacturing process, these vendors charge a lot of money based on the node that you're selecting. So Typically, when it's the smaller node, let's say like a four nanometer node or a three nanometer node, it is going to be much more expensive than let's say five nanometer node or seven nanometer node. So the smaller the node, more expensive it is to manufacture that CPU. It's important for you to understand this cost of manufacturing because it puts into context how much, you know, expensive it is going to be to manufacture the chip. And as a result, how expensive it is going to be the device that you're buying that has that chip. So the cost of manufacturing matters a lot. 
see you can make a super impressive chip if you put enough effort you can put you can make a chip you can make a mega chip which has like lots of cpu cores lots of gpu cores it has got big memory bus you know for big memory bandwidth wide memory bandwidth okay you can fit big npus for ai performance you can put a big media engine that will support you know media codecs of all sorts of media codecs but at the end of the day after you've put all those in your chip you see the chip has become huge and it and it is very impractical to manufacture because the cost of manufacturing using you know a smaller node like let's say 3 nanometer or 4 nanometer will be super expensive so you put all your cores your gpu cores your cache your uh, you know npu your video processing unit you put everything in the chip and then the chip has become so big that it is impractical to manufacture because the cost of manufacturing is so high it, it is unsustainable okay there may be defects in manufacturing because these are monolithic chips everything is in the same package it needs to be perfect at the first go so there may be manufacturing defects there will be you know it's basically will be very expensive and uh, unsustainable to produce and then you put that in a motherboard the motherboard will be more complex when you make a big chip okay and uh, overall the cost of the product will skyrocket basically it will become uh, impractical to make such a chip and this is where it's important to get some context the apple m2 pro which the which snapdragon is comparing itself against the apple m2 pro is a mighty impressive chip we know that but do you know how big that chip is? The Apple M2 Pro has a die area of around 282 millimeters squared. That is ginormous. For context, the desktop 7950X CPU, which has 16 performance cores spread across two CCDs with eight cores each. Each of those CCDs is around 71 millimeters squared, which, which gives you a total CPU surface area of around 140 uh, two millimeter squared so you can imagine how much smaller the 7950x is compared to an apple m2 pro we compared the apple m2 pro against other chips so and we talk about how impressive the apple m2 pro is now compare that apple m2 pro against a desktop 7950x which is so much smaller and yet the 7950x is over two times faster in terms of multi-core performance compared to the apple m2 pro so this is where it's important you have to understand the concept of manufacturing cost you know intel and amd why don't they make a cpu just like the apple m2 pro or apple m2 max or m3 max you know put a put lots of cores put a big integrated graphics you know why don't they make it that's because for the pc world making such a chip would be impractical it would be so expensive that you know hardware manufacturers like intel and amd won't be able to sustain that won't be able to convince pc buyers to actually buy that apple is able to do that because they're actually setting selling a you know final product Apple is not selling the chip. Apple is selling the whole entire PC, the laptop, you know, and it is also selling services, which is which is how Apple is able to mask that cost of that expensive chip. So now let's come back to the Snapdragon X8, which houses 12 performance cores. So all of its CPU cores are performance cores, which means they are they they have to be big in size. It has a pretty big integrated graphics that takes up like one quarter of the whole SoC space. It also has a pretty big NPU, a neural processing unit, which is almost as big as the iGPU in terms of the size. And it, it has like 45 tops of perf AI performance. And then the rest of the board has, you know, stuff like cache. It has got like 45 megabyte of cache. It has got other controllers for other devices. And all this has been fit in an die area of just 182 millimeter squared. Compare this to the 282 millimeter square die of the Apple M2 Pro. Which means Qualcomm has designed a chip that maybe, that maybe on TSMC's 4 nanometer node, may be affordable enough to be manufactured. It's important because the cost of the CPU will dictate how expensive will be the motherboard and other components and eventually the cost of the actual laptops or devices that the Snapdragon X8 will come in. Now, to be fair with Apple, the Apple M2 Pro is very is much bigger because also, you know, benefit of the doubt, it also has a much bigger integrated graphics compared to the Xelite. So the the Snapdragon Xelite's uh, graphical performance is similar to the base Apple M2 chip, uh, but compared to the uh, Apple M2 Pro, the Apple M2 Pro has a much bigger GPU. It also has a bigger media engine, which has like ProRes and ProRes RAW decoding, which the Snapdragon Xelite doesn't have expectedly. Uh, but 
Like I said, the Snapdragon X Select does support AV1 encoding and decoding, which the Apple M2 Pro doesn't support. Remember that. So overall, with the benchmarks and how small the chip is, in my opinion, the Snapdragon X Select is one of the most impressive CPUs or, you know, SOCs, I should use the correct word, it's an SOC uh, that I've come across in the last few generations. Uh, so kudos to Qualcomm for designing this chip. However, finally, I want to move on to some of the cons and some of the skepticism that I have. How good is going to be Windows x86 to ARM, you know, emulation? Because all the applications, like most applications will not be optimized for ARM. They will be running in emulation mode. So how good will be the emulation? How much more overhead will be there? Because remember, this emulation is not the same as uh, Apple's Rosetta 2 translation layer. Okay, there is a difference between how both of these work. Uh, also, you know, making a emulator or like a translation layer like Apple's Rosetta is not so easy. It has been possible for Apple because Apple owns both the hardware and the software. Like they have complete vertical integration where, whereas Microsoft doesn't have that, you know, luxury. Uh, Microsoft has to work with Snapdragon. Maybe in the future they have to work with Intel uh, and they have to work with uh, AMD for a joint effort to optimize the stuff. So it is not going to be easy for Windows, uh, for Microsoft to do, to achieve this, to achieve an emulation or a translation layer as good as Apple's Rosetta. It's a problem by the nature of how these companies work. On top of this, I had mentioned earlier that yes, the Snapdragon XL is a very tiny chip on, on TSMC's 4 nanometer node, but still 182 millimeter squared is also not too, uh, not incredibly tiny, okay? And it is using TSMC's 4 nanometer node. So, I am still, I still wonder how expensive it is going to be to manufacture. On top of that, remember, you won't have access to expandable RAM, you won't have ex access to expandable storage as far as I understand. I'm pretty sure both of these uh, will be soldered down. And also, remember guys, uh, the cost matters a lot because are you ready to pay like let's say these devices are like 1500 US dollars with 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes SSDs. Will you sacrifice, uh, you know, gaming laptops or thin and light gaming laptops that are available now with dedicated GPUs like an RTX 3050 and RTX, uh, you know, 4050, which are much more powerful than the uh, integrated graphics that is present in the Snapdragon X8. So there's a lot of stuff at stake here. So let's see how all these turns, turns out. But these are some genuine skepticism that I have and I want to talk about those. So that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. What do you think about the Snapdragon x Elite? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications and also join our Telegram community, guys. Link in the description. Engage in tech discussions with like-minded people and get alerted on the best tech deals the earliest. With that said, guys, take care and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.